Thanks, Michael. Thanks, um, uh, Arm, for the opportunity. Um, it's a great meeting once again this year, and thank you all for hanging in there. I know I stand between you and your break. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking to you about Replicell Life Sciences, which is a cell therapy company leveraging the cells derived from the hair follicle. So in that sense, it's one of the unique um, um, companies in the world because it's um, um, one of the only companies that I'm aware of um, using that as, a, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the cell source. Am I responsible for a pressure? Oh, yeah, there we go, the big green button. So we're a publicly traded company based in Canada, trading on the, on the TSX Venture and in the OTC in the United States. While it makes some forward-looking statements, you should do your own homework. So uh, as I said, we're a cell therapy company uh, looking to uh, move into um, um, re regenerate um, hair growth, restore damaged uh, skin, and repair chronically injured tendons. So you have the luxury also this afternoon in this session of hearing the only two cell therapy companies that are actually pursuing um, the treatment of tendinopathies. We've moved two of those products into the clinic this year, so we have three products in clinical development. Um, and, um, and, a, and, a, um, and a device, a dermal injector device also that is targeted for CE mark next year. So I'll give you some granularity on each one of those as we walk through the, the deck. This is essentially a, a simple schematic of the, um, of the cell therapy um, um, process. The, the patient is diagnosed. Uh, both of our cell populations are derived from a single suture biopsy from the back of the patient's head. In that biopsy are 20 to 25 growth stage hair follicles from which we have derived one of two cell populations depending on the product we're looking to manufacture. The dermal sheath cup cell populations, which you see at the base of that microscopic um, hair follicle image, is the, is the cell population which we believe can be responsible for the treatment of androgenic alopecia, otherwise known as pattern baldness. The other is a fibroblast cell population, which has nothing to do with hair growth at all, but is responsible for the maintenance of the tissue that compri that's comprises the, uh, the hair follicle. It's a fibroblast in many senses of the word, but it's unique in one respect, and this is the respect with which we intend to, to leverage it, and that is its high expression of type 1 collagen. So in the published literature in our hands, it's three to five times more expressive of type 1 collagen than any other fibroblast in the human body, and that's what we expect it to do in the places where we put them. So it's a simple cell expansion play. We expand the cells over four to six, five to eight weeks, depending on the uh, product we're looking to manufacture. Unlike a lot of cell therapy, autologous cell therapy companies, we cryopreserve in the aseptic vial and we ship it back to the clinic for reinjection. And in the case of the scalp and the skin, we have a proprietary injector device for reasons um, not, a, not unlike um, Ken described in the previous talk. So we believe the fibroblasts are a, truly a platform technology. If we can treat the tendon in your ankle, we have no reason to believe why we can't treat the, ta the, uh, the tendon in your, um, in your knee and um, both the tendons in your elbow, et cetera. And the dermal sheath cups is a single product um, um, focus for uh, the treatment of hair loss. So the other thing I think that is important to keep in mind about Replicell Life Sciences is we do not aspire to take things commercial. We believe that the most value you create for shareholders is in that early stage discovery to, to mid-stage um, clinical development. And then we want to license with sophisticated partners who understand how to bring products into the markets the, for which our products are being targeted. And we want to also leverage their capital and their infrastructure and their expertise for those late stage trials. So that's, um, that's the licensing strategy. The business strategy is to keep things um, as virtual as possible. We don't invest in bricks and mortar. We contract manufacturer. We contract use contract research and contract people as much as possible to try and focus as much of our capital on R&D and maximizing the assets as possible, including, and I think this is uh, important to understand, including the things which are ancillary around the biologic yourself. And I think we've seen far too many cell therapy companies in the past focus Focus so dependently and myopically on the th on the product, on the cell therapy product, that they perhaps forget to invest or just assume that the problems around manufacturing, cost of production, delivery into the patients will solve themselves if you deliver the if you deliver the right kind of biologic. And we believe, as an asset building company, that the right thing to do in terms of building the value around those biologics themselves are to invest in those things and invest in those things early. So we're investing in the manufacturing, in the packaging, in the delivery, and the other things which build value around your core biologic. So we also have a very sort of simple philosophy of life. There are very many elegant science 
um, uh, um, um, science projects and, and, and clinical development projects out there treating very sophisticated diseases. Um, but we have a cell population that we think we understand what it does. We grow more of them. We don't modify them or differentiate them. We put them locally in areas where those cells can perform that very simple function. We don't deliver them systemically, and we, um, and we depend on those cells to do um, what we understand them to do. Very simple um, um, explanation of the, of the science. The dermal sheath cup cells is the original technology that the company was founded on. It's this cell population that's attacked by the androgen hormone from those people who suffer from androgenic alopecia. There's a direct correlation between the androgen and attack on that cell population. As that cell population diminishes, the hair fiber diminishes. What we also know about androgenic alopecia, as you've observed in most, um, in most of your everyday life, is that most bald people still have hair at the back of their head. And that's because the cell population, the hair follicle and the cell population in that hair follicle are insensitive to the, the attack of the androgen hormone. And that's why microtransplant surgery works. You can take a follicle at the back of your head, transplant it to the top, and that follicle will continue to grow hair for the rest of your life. But it's a bloody, messy, expensive, highly variable procedure. And so what we're looking to do is capture the cells that we believe are ultimately responsible for that cell cascade that grows hair, simply grow more of them and transplant them to migrate where they want to sit at the base of the hair follicle and regenerate the hair growth in multiple follicles at a time. So it's a cell transplant as opposed to a follicular transplant model. So what all we're looking to do is replace the dermal sheath cell, cup cell population in those patients with an, with an androgen insensitive dermal sheath cup cell population. So the fibroblasts are in the sheath of the hair follicle, and their job, as I said, is to maintain the integrity of that, of that follicle through the expression of proteins like type 1 collagen. So we've moved two assets, into, um, two assets from the fibroblast platform into the clinic this year. The first is a phase 1-2 trial for the treatment of chronic Achilles tendinosis. It's a placebo, randomized placebo-controlled trial. We're studying VISA and VAS scores, as you saw from um, um, OrthoCell. Those are meaningful scores, but also doing ultrasound imagery. Um, because we think that the, that the most meaningful um, um, image that you can get um, uh, is, is to actually understand how much you've restored the, um, the, 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 the tendon itself. And what we're doing is we're leveraging, I'll just go back for a moment, we're leveraging the, um, the clinical work of a collaborator named David Connell out of London who did, sorry, I'm jumping around here on you. Ah, what have I done now? I'm pressing so many buttons. We're, uh, we are leveraging the work of David Connell out of London, who did three small phase one trials in um, different tendinopathies, including this one in chronic Achilles tendinoses, and a nice restoration of function and elimination of pain to nice statistical values against a, an active control. And most importantly, had this type of imagery. This is actually the image. You can see the leg, bone, and foot of, a, um, of, of one of the patients in that trial. It's a 63-year-old man, refractory to all other kinds of treatments, um, had failed physiotherapy, failed other kinds of uh, treatment modalities, was an eligible for the trial. And this is the, the image below is exactly what you want to see in a, in a, in a healthy, functioning, pain-free tendon, is the long, linear strands of type 1 collagen, which are indicative of a strong... Um, functioning tendon. This is the same, the man's same tendon six months after a single injection of type 1 uh, or of skin derived fibroblasts. And when we were locking up our intellectual property around our fibroblasts derived from the hair follicle, we went to David Connell, who had just published this work, and we said, We really like your clinical models, really like your clinical work. We think we've got a more powerful cell type to accomplish this or better. Um, because we've got a cell type that's more expressive of type 1 collagen than the one that you used in your trial. And he wasn't inclined to like us at first, but eventually, the long story short, has folded up shop, folded up his IP into our company, and has joined us as a clinical collaborator because we believe that the mechanism of action is just that. It's the, type one exp it's the expression of type 1 collagen to affect this kind of repair that you can see in this image. So the other product that from the fibroblast cell population that we moved into the clinic in Germany this time, um, this year, is a, um, is, a, is a clinical, phase one clinical trial approved by the Paul Ehrlich Institute and now in starting to enroll patients um, for uh, the, essentially the repair of the extracellular matrix from those people who suffer from a thinning, as we all do, from a thinning of the extracellular matrix um, as we age. And this is actually... 
um, um, stained uh, 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 histology of, of young skin, stained for type 1 collagen versus old skin. Not surprisingly, as you age, that extracellular matrix thins. And about $2 billion of hyaluronic acid are sold in the world per year to essentially fill that space um, um, synthetically for a period of time so that topically your skin looks more full and robust and young and less wrinkly. And what we're essentially looking to do is to inject cells that are capable of excreting the kinds of protein, not the least of which is type 1 collagen, to actually rebuild that extracellular matrix under the skin. But dermatology is rife with all kinds of fuzzy endpoints and, 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 and marketing science. And what we really wanted to understand in this trial is whether we were doing something meaningful biologically under the skin. So we've designed perhaps what is one of the first cell therapy trials in the world using healthy volunteers. And this has been approved by the Paul Ehrlich. And what we've done is while ultimately we want to treat the face and the upper necks and the hands of patients who have this, um, who have skin that they want to look younger, we've designed a trial for this trial, the phase one trial, where we're, where we're doing four different injections in the, in the lower back of patients, four different injection points. It's placebo controlled, but also a placebo injection um, point, single injection, double injection, triple injection. And then after six months of those injections, um, we actually biopsy. That's why we're doing the backs of healthy volunteers. We're biopsying those injection points to send part of those biopsy materials to histopathology to actually measure how much we've reconstructed that extracellular matrix. And then the other biopsies we're sending for fax analysis to, to measure how much we've upregulated or downregulated as the case may be biomarkers that are as well established in the published literature associated with aging and sun damaged skin. So what we believe we'll have, even though this is a phase one study, um, what we believe we'll have is a very um, instructive uh, data package that will give us very, very informed go, no go data on whether or not we're doing something meaningful and potentially even capable of being licensed. So the other uh, um, trial that's in the product that's in clinical development is our RCH01. This is for the treatment of pattern baldness. We've completed a phase one trial um, a couple of years ago in this study. And you can see, I won't go into how it compares against standard of care. Um, typically at 12 months, you see peak um, 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 results from whether you're taking a drug called Propecia. Women can't take it. It has side effects like erectile dysfunction. Um, a topical like Rogaine, typically you see 7 to 16% increase in hair density, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't stop the baseline, the baseline progression of the disease. So eventually, you know, an increase even 16% over four hairs, you don't care anymore, and so you stop taking it. Um, what we think we're doing here is actually, as I said, regenerating hair growth with the cell population, which doesn't cure the disease, but because the cells are immune to the attack of the androgen hormone, you've got a functional cure. So the data was sufficient enough, let me say this, to be commercially uh, meaningful to um, our partner now, Shiseido, um, which is the fourth largest cosmetic company in the world, who did a license on that technology for Asia and is co-developing this product with us now in Japan. So they did a $35 million deal signed in 2013, $4 million up front, $31 million in milestone payments, plus royalties. But the iceberg below the water on this deal is that they're also commercially, financially committed to funding all the clinical work in Japan first and in all their a Asian markets, all the regulatory approvals, the manufacturing, and the sales, marketing, and, menu, and, um, and distribution costs. So they've commissioned their facility, they've got PMD approval on this, and, and we're moving forward, and we expect this trial to launch in Japan in the next um, a number of weeks. So, um, and we have aspirations as well to do our, our own trial of this um, in Europe starting next year to really study dosing and frequency of treatment. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll get to our final device, which is an injector device. We discovered um, when we were looking to deliver our cells into the scalp and skin that there was no device out there that controlled for um, the, the uh, consistent delivery of our cells. And so we wanted to create a device that took as much of the art out of the delivery as possible. Most of the, de the device deliveries are still up to the thumb driving the, the, uh, the device. So what we've come up with, and this is a design-locked um, version of the device now that's moving into prototype build, is a device that's uh, very elegantly designed to deliver not only consistency in the results, because that's a touchscreen there where you see our logo, but um, so you can program the depth and dose of delivery, but also has a number of other value add um, components to it that can be used for the injection of anything you want to inject into the skin, not only our cells. So um, it has a number of different elements. One is the, this Pelche element at this U-shaped thing you see um, at, the, um, at the end of the device. 
obviates the need for local anesthetic. So most dermal in injections you see now are, are preceded by micro-injections of local anesthetic. That's, pa that's, that's painful because there's it's lots of little injections, but it's also painful because any of you have had local anesthetic in the skin. It's actually a fair amount of pain associated with that. That element actually freezes the skin on contact. The needle penetrates. It delivers the injectable as the needles retract according to the depth, the pre-specified depth and dose. So you get consistency of, of aesthetic results. You increase the patient experience. You, you better the patient experience because there's a lot less pain. And perhaps not unimportantly, you also increase the throughput that the doctors can, um, can do in an hour because you make the procedure a lot less time intensive. So um, um, just to wrap up, in 2015, we uh, launched two products into the, um, into, the, um, into the clinic. We've got the three products now in, in clinical development. We're moving our, our other platform, our Fibroblast platform, through review in the PMDA um, because we have, again, um, aspirations to license not only um, um, globally but first and foremost in Japan for all the reasons that have been talked about in a number of sessions um, um, this year. So we're, the last slide, we're a, we're a cell therapy company, early stage, relatively early stage cell therapy company that will have two clinical readouts next year. Both tendon and dermatology trials will read out data next year. And the device is targeted to have a CE mark um, for the injection of hyaluronic acid um, next year as well. So all of those we expect to be licensable events. Thank you.